great. Thank you, Phil, for that lovely introduction. Almost, I, I almost don't even have to give my talk at this point in time because he's, he's summed up a lot of the, the salient features. Um, but thank you also, Randy, for, for your attendance here and for the support that you give the department. So what I'm going to tell you very briefly and at a very high level about is the kind of research that my group, uh, the Laboratory for Hybrid Quantum Systems, is uh, doing to both create and control systems of matter that obey the laws of quantum physics. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, now, this part about one electron at a time is a little bit tongue in cheek at this point, because as you'll see, most of the systems that, that we study are minimally made up of hundreds of millions of electrons, like this electronic device that we have attached to uh, uh, one of the cryostats in the lab downstairs. Um, but what you'll also see is that if you can get the system to behave in just the right way, even if you have 100 million electrons, that device can behave as if it were a single quantum object that you can control and manipulate and understand. So that's a little cut off. But, um, the, you don't have to be a physicist to appreciate quantum physics. Um, it's absolutely everywhere. And I don't mean in the, in the atoms and the electrons in the chair that you're sitting in. I mean specifically in pop culture. So this is, um, I have a one-year-old. He's, he's back there. And, uh, and uh, you can get this book on Amazon. It's, it's, if you, for those of you that can't see the title, it's, it says Quantum Physics for Babies. So in, in our household, we start them really early. Uh, the, another place that, that you might interact with the quantum world is in video games. So I don't know if you're familiar with the video game Minecraft. Some of you might be. Um, there is a module that you can get for this video game that uh, teaches you the laws of quantum physics. And this was actually developed by some of my uh, friends at Caltech. Uh, another place where, where this kind of thing appears is you can go to IBM's research website, which you can see here. Um, and you can go and interact with something that they call their quantum experience. So what this allows you to do is through the web on a browser, you can write a small program, run an experiment that will be transported through the cloud to IBM's small quantum computer at their research facility. And you can write experiments that can be run in real time on that machine. And finally, I want to highlight this, this cover of the Technology Quarterly, which appeared in The Economist on relatively recently, March 2017. Um, now, the title of the article was Here, There, and Everywhere, Quantum Technologies Are Starting to Come Into Their Own. Um, and I love this article, but I especially love this animation because I feel a very uh, a kindredness to this fellow right here. He's trying to do what it is that we're trying to do in the lab. Namely, he's trying to control the laws of quantum physics. And he's got you know, some atoms. I presume that's what those are. And he's trying to juggle them from one place to another and manipulate them in any way he wants. And in fact, you know, he's got a hold of them right here, and things are going OK. And then he turns his head, and oop, he drops them on the floor. And that's actually very similar to what happens in the day-to-day -day experiences in our group. We, we think we've got some experiment figured out. We've got you know, the quantum states exactly where we want. And then we drop them all on the floor. The, uh, but another thing that I love is, is, is this image. Um, and this image is important um, because when I was an undergrad starting out, that's when I learned about, about quantum physics. And this image really struck home early on for me. And what it is is a very specific kind of microscope is being used to image iron atoms. That's these blue peaks and some electrons that are floating around inside of this corral that's been created by these iron atoms. And uh, this, when I saw this when I was an undergraduate starting in physics, uh, this was work that was done in, at IBM's research lab in the early 90s. Uh, it really drove home this point that, OK, we as a species are now in a position where we can take single quantum objects like atoms and arrange them essentially in any way we want and control the laws of quantum physics. The other reason I love this image is because uh, it, it contains the two salient features of quantum, quantum physics that I want you to keep in mind for the rest of my talk. Namely, that in the quantum world, objects are both particles, like these iron atoms, or they can be waves, like these electrons that form these ripples in this, in this pond here. Um, and this duality between particle-like nature and wave-like nature is at the heart of quantum physics and leads to all of the strange phenomena that we are really interested in studying. So for the rest of the time that I have with you, what I'm going to just tell you about is three short things. I'm going to tell you about what it is that we actually do in the lab, both with creating quantum states of matter and then controlling uh, tailor-made quantum objects. 
And the motivations there are twofold. One of them is, is associated with fundamental questions about exploring the quantum world in a way that, that we don't know about yet. And the other one is to hopefully leverage any kinds of control schemes that we can come up with for technological advantage. And then I'm gonna tell you about how we do that. And so, as Phil mentioned, me and my, my group, we're, we're experts in low temperature physics, so this is the, this is the cool part of the talk, pun intended. <laughs> um, and then I'll just close the loop quickly and remind you about why it is that we, we wanna both create and control quantum systems. So okay, we wanna create quantum phases of matter. But let me remind you, let's get all on the same page about what I mean by phases of matter first. And what I mean are the ones you normally think about, the ones you interact with in your day-to-day -day lives. Uh, solids, liquids, and gases. So these are the prototypical phases of matter. You have water in your house. At room temperature, it's a liquid. You cool it down, it freezes, it becomes a solid. You heat it up sufficiently high, and it boils and becomes a gas. Well, those are the normal ones, but it turns out that if you, if you introduce the laws of quantum physics, then you can get a whole host of other strange and fascinating forms of matter, electronic matter, as you'll see, that have nothing, that have almost no resemblance to these, these normal ones. And it's ultimately this wavy particle nature of quantum mechanics that leads to these forms of matter, these exotic forms of matter. And so that's one half of what we want to do in my group. We want to create new quantum phases of matter, specifically where electrons behave in ways that they've never behaved before. Uh, and we do that by confining them into two dimensions. So we take electrons and we squeeze them down into a sheet, just strictly two-dimensional sheet. Imagine billiard balls rolling around on a pool table. And the reason that's important to squeeze them down is, remember, quantum mechanics, quantum physics has this wavy nature to it. And so when you squeeze these electron waves down into two dimensions, it allows you to control exactly where the peaks and troughs of these waves are. You can get different electrons inter interfering and interacting with each other in ways that lead to a whole variety of strange forms of matter. So you can get fluids in which these electrons get chopped up. They're not, these electrons don't behave like the electrons that you learn about in high school or in college. They, they get chopped up into pieces, say a third of an electron. So you have a fluid where the electrons are broken up. Or they can, if you get the interference to work in just another way, they can form these large liquid crystalline states where you have many thousands of electrons working together. Or you can freeze them in two dimensions. You can get electronic solids. This is just a, a, a few of the kinds of states of matter that already are known to exist. And we're looking for new ones in these systems. And so one place where we look for those is in, so we have to somehow now get electrons to be in two dimensions. One way to do it is to get a semiconductor layer cake. So this is a little sample that has a layer cake of different semiconductor materials. In one of those layers, electrons can get stuck in two dimensions. So these are, these are one way to realize this kind of material. Another one uh, is shown here. Uh, and this is uh, a device where we take a single sheet of atoms, graphene in this case, and we attach electrical leads to it and measure its properties. But the graphene itself, it's one atomic layer thick, and the electrons flow along that layer. And so that produces the two dimensions we need. And then the other one is a very exotic state that we can create ourselves in the lab. And it looks like this. So we have a layer of liquid helium onto which we can just sprinkle electrons. Well, my grad students and postdocs do this. I don't do it so often. Um, but those, those electrons land on the surface, and they actually float above the surface and are bound there. And they can move around in two dimensions on that helium surface. And so these three, these systems are all different. But the common thing that they have is this two-dimensionality. And that allows us to, to create these new kinds of quantum phases of matter and to try to find them here. The other aspect that we're really interested in doing is trying to control single quantum objects. And these are gonna be electronic devices also. But before we get to that, I wanna show you the simplest of all quantum objects, this purple ball. So this purple ball is a quantum object because it can either live here at this level, which I've called zero, or it can live up here in this level one. Now, um, the wonderful thing about this purple ball is that it can't it can live here or here, or because of the rules of quantum physics, it can actually live in both places simultaneously. And that's completely counterintuitive, but that's, that's at the heart of, of what makes quantum physics interesting. And so when I say we want to control it, what we want to do is be able to move it up here, move it back down, or create a situation where it exists in both places at once. So we don't actually have a purple ball in the lab, but what we do have is this. And so this is a box that it's made out of aluminum, and it has a slot that's cut into it. 
And if you look right here, there's a little chip that we place inside of that, that aluminum box. And if you zoom in, what you see is this nanofabricated electronic device. So this is only two micrometers in diameter, or in, in width. And uh, these kinds of devices we can fabricate in the world-class uh, clean room facilities that we have here at MSU, the Keck uh, Microfabrication Facility. Um, and so, but it turns out this, this circuit, it's an electrical circuit, it behaves very much like this quantum ball. We can put it in a state that is in a level zero or a level one, or we can mix and match and create a situation where it exists in both of those situations simultaneously. Um, and we do that by shining microwave signals into and out of this box. And uh, here's just an example of some of that data. It's cut off here. But what, what this data shows is the probability of this circuit either living here at 0 or here at 1. And as we, as we change the, uh, the control using these microwave signals that go into and out of the box. And uh, you can see it at zero time, the thing lives here in, its, in, in the lower level. And we can control the situation where we mix both of these quantum states together with high fidelity. OK, so in order to see these kinds of quantum effects, we actually have to torture these systems pretty dramatically. Um, and the most important condition that we have to subject them to, Phil already mentioned this, is extremely low temperatures. And so we do that in these large apparatuses that we have down in the lab. This is called a cryostat, but it's essentially just a refrigerator, a fancy refrigerator. And we can achieve, if you, if you take off all of these shields, what you find is this gold-plated platform inside that we can attach experiments to and send uh, sensitive control signals down into the experiment. Um, I'll mention that this, this large superstructure was uh, made here at MSU in the physics and astronomy machine shop. Um, and uh, the temperatures that we can achieve here are very close to absolute zero, the coldest that you can imagine, uh, specifically about 10 millikelvin. To give you some idea of how cold that is, the air that you are currently breathing is a gas. At some point in time, it will, f it will become a liquid, like water. And at these temperatures, it's a completely frozen crystalline solid. Everything except quantum physics is frozen at these temperatures. And the importance of having these very low temperatures is because heat and temperature completely scramble these very delicate, fragile quantum states that we want to create. Imagine that you're at a cocktail party and you're trying to have a conversation with your friend. The room's really loud. You can't hear what your friend is saying. You guys can't interact. But if you were to somehow be able to lower the volume in the background, you'd be able to hear the person that you're talking to. That's exactly what we're trying to do here. The temperature lowers the volume and allows for the electrons in our system to interact with each other and talk and for these waves to interfere with one another. And then we can see this kind of physics. Now, just to give you another demonstration of how cold this is, the coldest place outside of the laboratory that you can imagine is interstellar space. But that's a balmy 2.7 degrees Kelvin, hundreds of times hotter than, than the temperatures that we routinely achieve in my lab. Um, you shouldn't put your cat in outer space. It's not, yeah. So we also need very large magnetic fields. And again, the magnetic field here we, we apply is about 14 tesla. It again lives here. To give you some idea. This is about uh, several hundred thousand times larger than the Earth's ambient magnetic field. And the reason that we need such large magnetic fields is, again, because we have to squeeze these waves. And the magnetic field allows us to, to manipulate the waves of the electrons in just the right way to produce this quantum, these quantum effects. Um, the other place that you may have experienced large magnetic fields, if you've had an MRI, uh, at a hospital, they have large magnets, several tesla. Two, three tesla is the, the field. So we have 14 in, in the lab. Um, and Phil mentioned this before, we have to do very sensitive electrical measurements. Because you can imagine, if you put too big of a signal into, the, into, the, into either the two-dimensional electron system or into these quantum objects, you completely scramble them. So you have to be able to measure very, very small electrical signals. And, and the folks in my lab are expert at that as well. And so finally, I just want to close the loop. I'm almost done. Um, and remind you about why it is that we want to study these very exotic systems. On the one hand, nature speaks ultimately a quantum mechanical language. These electrons and atoms and, and, and particles of light, they all talk to each other in a quantum language. And so what we want to do is understand that language. We want to figure out what are the rules that, that govern nature at its most fundamental level. And these are the, our mission here is one of exploration and discovery. What are the frontiers that, that, that we don't know about in terms, of, in terms of the fundamental laws of physics? And the other motivation for what we do is 
for the potential of future applications. So can we take the knowledge that we learn about how quantum systems behave and use them for things like precision sensing or simulation or computation? Can we, and in fact, these ideas behind computation are very important because there's the, it's known theoretically, and people are working hard to realize this, that if you, if you can build a computer that utilizes the laws of quantum physics, you can do, you can essentially revolu revolutionize computer science and do, solve kind, the kinds of problems that currently aren't solvable on the world's best supercomputers. And this is just an example of a very small quantum computer that Google invented recently. Um, and uh, so the, I forgot one extremely important ingredient for studying these quantum systems. You need enthusiastic, smart people to work with. Um, and it's an absolute pr pleasure for me to work with this happy group of physicists right here. Um, so this is the group that works in the Laboratory for Hybrid Quantum Systems. So Heejin Byun, Justin Lane, Liang Zhijiang, and Steve Hemmerly are uh, our PhD students that work in my group. Uh, Anna Turnbull and Josh Millam are MSU undergrads. Anna actually graduated last semester, and uh, Josh is graduating after this semester. Uh, and uh, Dr. Kostya Nazyedkin is actually, <laughs> hey buddy, um, is a, uh, it's almost over. Uh, the <laughs> professor, Kostian, uh, uh, Dr. Kostian Nazietkin, is a world leading expert in studying this really funny uh, electron system that can form on the surface of liquid helium. And he joined the group this last summer. Um, and finally, I just want to thank, uh, that's the end. Uh, so thanks to all of you for listening, and thanks to my collaborators uh, on these various projects. Um, and uh, in particular to Professor Mark Dickman, who is my partner in crime when it comes to trying to understand these uh, electronic states on the surface of helium. And in particular, uh, none of this work would be possible without, without you know, financial support to, to support us. And so I want to specifically thank the National Science Foundation and also uh, the collaboration that we have with Dr. John Reno at Sandia National Labs, which is uh, funded by the DOE through their Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies. Uh, and last but absolutely not least, thank you, Randy, for the support that you provide to the department and also to, to my group in particular. <laughs>